tests, the final day. These are the voyages of the Ontario post-secondary sector. It's four-day mission to explore strange new hybrid worlds, to seek out new digital by design life and new connections, to boldly go where no community has gone before. Greetings, everyone. Welcome back to test day four, our final day or the final frontier as Captain Kirk would say. Once again, my name is Lindsay Woodside, Acting Director of Programs and Services with the organization. Joining me to kick things off this afternoon is Laura Vaselli, Research and Evaluation Associate with eCampus Ontario. As we wrap up our final day of tests, we invite you to check out the virtual booths in the VLS showcase found in the left-hand side of this conference portal. The sector is undertaking some really fabulous, collaborative, cross-institutional and multidisciplinary work in the virtual learning space that is really inspiring to read about and will provide you with some advanced intel on what high quality open digital assets are forthcoming out of this project work early next year. Assets of which will be freely and openly accessible to our sector through the eCampus Ontario Open Library. At this point, it's important to note that eCampus Ontario has released a call for expressions of interest for the second round of funding in support of the Government of Ontario's virtual learning strategy. So this is new strategic funding that is available, which builds on an initial investment of 50 million in virtual learning in January of 2021. Please consider visiting the link in the chat for more information and to submit an expression of interest. We have had an amazing time with all of you over the last four days. You heard from Alyssa yesterday that every year TESS evolves, uh, ideally avoiding replicating the, the tech meltdown of 2019. Uh, and we do so with the feedback from our community. We will be sending out a feedback survey closer to the end of today. And we would be so grateful if you could take a few minutes to complete that. We begin today's programming with a keynote focused on decolonization, delivered by Coulter Asinoue. Coulter offers a student lens on the needs and experiences of learners at Ontario's Indigenous Institutes. After we hear from Coulter, you have some choices to what sessions and workshops you attend this afternoon. For example, at 2.30, we will be, we will be welcoming Dr. Nicole Johnson, uh, who is the Research Director at the Canadian Digital Learning Research Association, or the CDLRA. The CDLRA is Canada's top research body for tracking the development of online and digital learning in public post-secondary institutions. They track the trends and developments in digital learning in Canada and compare those trends with others, sorry, compare those trends with those in other constituencies. CDLRA has been working in partnership with eCampus Ontario over the past year to compile the research Dr. Johnson will be presenting today. If you don't catch Dr. Johnson's session, the benefit of a virtual conference is that you can return at a later date and time to this conference portal and watch the recordings of anything you might have missed. The recordings should be posted by the end of November. Please do keep an eye on our social media channel, channels where we will be providing notice that these are available uh, via our Twitter and LinkedIn accounts. You might have noticed uh, that eCampus Ontario has welcomed a lot of new faces this year, and Laura is one of those new faces. Welcome, Laura. Before I pass it over to Laura to introduce Coulter, I wanted to invite her to briefly share some of her reflections as a first-time TESS attendee. So here we go, Laura. Question number one. What are some of your impressions of TESS as a first-time attendee? Thank you, Lindsay, and thank you for the hot seat with the questions. I think um, for me, what I've noticed um, so far and most predominantly is really the level of engagement at, at TESS. I think when you go to a conference, especially an online conference, you don't know who you're going to meet and how you're going to engage with them, but everyone I've, I've spoken to and met has been very open and, and really wanting to get to know one another. And I think um, the other main takeaway I have is something that we say at the Research and Evaluation and Foresight Unit, and that's to challenge ideas and not people. 
all the conversations we're having are so robust. You see two sides, three sides to every idea, project, initiative. Um, and I'm walking away with a lot of really, really great insights. And I thank everyone at TESS for, for giving that to the rest of the attendees. Thanks for sharing those meaningful first impressions, Laura. Question number two, what has been the conference highlight for you as we wind down? I think, well, TESS isn't over, so I'm, maybe I'll change my answer later today. But <laughs> I think as of right now, I feel um, very grateful to be walking away, not only inspired and rejuvenated, which I think is a lot of times what people seek when they go to conferences, but I really feel like I have a, a very strong set of tools and strategies and people I could connect with. Um, I'm walking away with a very long to-do list and a lot of ideas. Um, and I think, and I'm very grateful for that. Thanks, Laura. Did you get a, a chance to check out the VLS showcase? I did, I did. And I'm, I'm happy you said that you did because then the next part of my question <laughs> would make sense. <laughs> what did you think of some of the work, Laura, that the sector is engaged in? Oh, wow. I mean, I have, there's, I have so much feedback and I, I'm so excited because I know that's just a sample of some of the VLS projects. Um, but I think what it really reiterated for me to see is, is again, that collaboration, not just across institutions, but within them. And there's the recognition and by project teams to really intentionally design projects with the right expertise, the right input, so much feedback from users, whether that be learners, instructors, instructional designers. And it really reaffirms that it, it takes a village to co-create this <laughs> digital by design future that we're all working towards. Um, and just, yeah, exceptional quality, exceptional attention to detail. Um, and I'm just really excited to see the breadth of, of all the finished products. That's great. Thanks, Laura. All right. Last question, straight up trivia style. Can you name three people you met and can you recall what institutions they are from? Okay. Three people. Three. Um, I met uh, Dorina from Conestoga College, uh, Krista from McMaster. Uh, I met Dr. Valerie Irvine uh, from University of Victoria yesterday in our networking session. And for bonus points, I will say I reconnected with uh, Christina from Uni the University of Toronto in the VLS showcase at their booth, so. Awesome, and I'm sure you, you met many, many, many more, oh, many. Uh, many more people as well. Thank you so much, Laura, for sharing your key insights and takeaways with, with us uh, this afternoon. Uh, now over to you. Wonderful, thank you. So I'm, I'm so excited to be here today and, and Coulter, I'll invite you now <clears throat> to unmute your microphone and turn on your camera as I get ready to introduce you to everyone. So um, like Lindsay mentioned, my name is Laura Vaselli. I'm a research and evaluation associate here at eCampus uh, where I'm also the virtual learning technical advisor for indigenous institutes. And um, I'm very excited to be here today because I've, I've spent my career in the post-secondary sector and throughout it, I've been really motivated by the ways in which learners and their communities have advocated for and co-created changes to their education systems. And today's speaker is one such advocate and change maker, and it is my absolute pleasure and honor to have Coulter close us out today. Uh, Coulter Asinoue is an Anishinaabe from Sault Ste. Marie, Ontario, and a member of the Kuchiching First Nation. He graduated from Algoma, Algoma University's history program, where he studied the long lasting effects and origins of colonialism. Today, drawing on the calls to action of the Truth and Reconciliation Commission and the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples, Coulter will discuss a path forward for post-secondary education in Ontario that honors Indigenous peoples, protects Indigenous knowledge, and engages in cultural dialogue and exchange. So please welcome Coulter, um, and I will get your PowerPoint on my screen. So before we begin today, I wrote a script and in this script, I realized I did not actually write down what uh, calls to action from the Truth and Reconciliation Commission in 2015 or the articles of the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples. So before we begin, I wanted to uh, highlight the articles and calls to action that I drew upon. So in terms of uh, from the Truth and Reconciliation Calls to Action. Call to Action number 62, 63, and 64 are all uh, directly dealing with education, uh, self-determination to education, and traditional rights to education in terms of uh, introducing cultural aspects, uh, both on and off reserve. 
and with the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples, Articles 12 through 14, 21, 23, 24, and 31, all have various uh, ranges dealing with, uh, once again, Indigenous self-determination to education, uh, modeling education systems, and changing current education systems to include what, uh, what many call these days the true history of the Indigenous peoples. So um, if need be, I can write those ones down and distribute them later, but I think we'll get right, right back into where I started. So, Ninga Gajwejatun Gianish Na Bemwen, Anibuju, Kultura Sinemai Indishnakash Daganashamang, Nimki Norino Jibwemang, Makwa Nindu Dem, Wapkwamakang and Seated First Nation in Dunjaba, Kuchiching First Nation in Dunjaba, Bawa Ting Nin Dunjaba, Minua Suse Marie Ninda, Agoma University, Minua Shingwa Kiruma Gegamek Nindanoki. <coughs> so, this uh, on screen right now is where uh, the first half of my family is from, Wakamakang and Seated First Nation. Uh, on the next slide, it will be Kuchiching First Nation, where the other half of my family is from. This one is over by Fort Francis, closer to the Ontario Manitoba border. And on the next slide is where I currently reside. And uh, Bawa Ting slash Algoma uh, Territory or Sault Ste. Marie. I'm reporting to you live from Algoma University as we speak. Uh, so, hello everyone and welcome. So I want to translate for you what I just said. And on the next slide uh, has all the uh, writing. Uh, so let me try to speak in Ishna Bemwan. My English name is Kultura Sinaway. My name in Ojibwe is Nimki Noden. The translation being gentle breeze before the storm. My clan is the Bear Clan. I am from Mekong and Seated First Nation, Kujiching First Nation, the Algoma Territory, and I reside in Sault Ste. Marie. I work for Algoma University and Chingwa Kinuma Gagamik as a recruitment officer with an Anishinaabe specialization. I want to preamble all of this, what I am about to share with you today, by saying I did not come before you today alone. I bear with me the education, knowledge, and understanding of many of my peers and friends. What I share with you today comes from a, commu comes from a community point of understanding. And while I could have consulted with more people, I believe what I have to share with you today is worthwhile. Before I continue, I wanted to smudge the space that I'm reporting to you from. <clears throat> so I will do that now. I have to do this very briefly because I did not actually uh, um, fill out a full smudging form. So I'll just be doing a very small area. And if you do have it, I encourage you to do the same. And the reason why I do this is because I recall that when our classes and meetings first went online at the beginning of the pandemic, among uh, other Indigenous people, there was some confusion on smudging protocols when it came to online virtual meetings. The way that I have always seen it is that in our hearts and our minds and our spirits are gathered in a single space that we all coincide in. And today that happens to be in offices, living rooms, dining rooms, bedrooms, and classrooms. <clears throat> I also want to start by, by saying that questions can be asked at any time in the chat, and I'll be taking breaks to answer any if they come. So today, I want to start off with how I got here, because only upon reflection, I realized how much intertwined my life journey is with decolonialism, or decolonization, excuse me. I want to begin at a period when I didn't know what decolonization was. It was in December of 2012. I was 14 at this time. I was in the kitchen where I first heard the term idle no more, and this is the starting point of my personal journey to who I am today, and to who I became. At this time, and I often refer to myself, and I genuinely apologize if I offend anyone in the crowd, an Indian. My mother and father had used this term. I had heard it on TV, and it was a common word growing up back, uh, when I went back to, uh, to the reserve during the summer. Later, I had heard the term Aboriginal and used it in my elementary school classes, but the word Indian is the one that I grew up with. And, a boy, and as a boy, I knew virtually nothing of who I was. I knew I was different, and I was taught by the society that I lived in that the color of my skin and length of my hair dictated uh, much about my life. 
I didn't necessarily understand what that meant as a boy. In school, I learned about a watered down and sanitized version of my culture in the school system, one I had very little attachment to. Of course, I eventually grew into a teenager and into a young man, and Aboriginal became the term that more and more people used. However, during this time, I learned to use my culture and my language as a tool in the modern world, something that I now understand that is not healthy nor good to do. It was in these formative years that the word Aboriginal too became part of my identity. It is only when I became an adult that I heard Indigenous and started, so, started on the path to sort out my identity. Truth be told, I am all three of these words that I and others have, I have known have used to describe myself. Indian as a legal term, Aboriginal term, uh, our Aboriginal as a borrowed word from Australia during a time of change, and Indigenous, a word that we now, now use very commonly and is widely accepted by some and refused by others. It's funny how sometimes three words can delineate an entire different phase of my life, and in many ways play a part in the complex identity I have today. I was also an adult when I grew closer to the term decolonization. I had first heard it in college where I was first, truly first exposed to our people and our languages. It was a slow process to be sure. I knew Ani and McWetch before, but not much else. I knew the history of the British and, the, uh, uh, excuse me, I knew the history after the British and the French landed and, and established the colonies and how my people and our relations interact with these settlers and colonials. I didn't know it at the time, but my hunger for knowledge is only going to grow. I graduated college and moved on to university where I engaged with cultural activities on a much deeper level. But still I had a sense of imposter syndrome, a sense that I'm not necessarily where I belong because I grew up in the city. That I was taking the place of someone who knew more than me, who wanted to be there more than me, and who was going to take part in a more meaningful manner than sitting on the side and observing. I did not understand yet that this was my place and that learning was part of the process, that there was no one to fill my place, no matter how much I told myself there was. Creator directed me there for a reason, and one that leads me here today. Over the years of my undergraduate degree, uh, undergraduate university experience, I filled leadership roles that were difficult on a spiritual level for me. People looked to me for answers I did not yet have, though I had a community to help me answer them. It helped fuel my imposter syndrome that even today I still struggle with. But while in retrospect, I can see my struggles, I can also see my successes. Dr. Andrew Judge introduced me to the terms acculturation and enculturation a spectrum of understanding culture, the connection to the land, the language, and the desire to know more about all three. Acculturation is on the lower end of that spectrum, and, on culture, and enculturation is on the higher end. Five years ago, I was, I was acculturated. Although I thought I had the drive to know more, I did not realize yet how hard the work was going to be. Three years ago, I was still acculturated, but I think I had found the path to enculturation and was beginning to walk it. Now I'm a little higher on that spectrum, not as high as some of my peers, but to a point where I'm much more comfortable with my identity, who I am and where I'm supposed to be. It's no surprise that what I described to you has a lot to do with the effects of colonialism and how I navigated it. The work of colonialism is entrenched in who I was a decade ago. It's also entrenched in our youth today. And that's really where I wanna begin our discussion. Colonization in the classroom is not just teaching Ojibwe youth about totem poles and telling them that this is their culture. Totem poles belong to the indigenous people of the Pacific Northwest, and while they are identifiably indigenous, they are not mine to take. Colonization in the classroom is also uh, the history of education, uh, how it is taught, oh, and sorry, and how it is taught, excuse me. Indigenous ways of knowing, understanding, and learning are different from Western and colonial ways. In a conversation, the words, you have to know your place, were spoken to me in a positive sense and not a negative. This isn't something I have encountered before in my journey to rediscover who I was. A much more palatable reconstruction of this phrase is along the lines of, you will find out where you belong. And this is just one small example of the difference in understanding in that, uh, in understanding and knowing, even how both settlers and indigenous use the same language, but with differences in that language's construction. There too is the idea that the ways of knowing and understanding are not always going to be behind a desk or inside a building. The understanding I have of indigenous worldview, philosophy, and learning from where I am residing is deeply rooted not just in culture-based activity, but land-based activity as well. These activities have a vast range from ceremony to construction to community outreach. Just a handful of, of examples and a sea of things that indigenous peoples can do and are doing to rediscover the indigenous ways of knowing and understanding. A couple of weeks ago, I visited Madagami First Nation near Timmins, Ontario. There I learned that they have a week-long a uh, culture camp where youth learn to live the, in the old ways. The age group that week was boys and girls seven to 12. 
So how does colonialism pervade our classrooms, our shops, and our hallways? How does it pervade our minds? We often heard, well, at least very least I did growing up, that Canada has two realities, English and French. I want to introduce you a third reality, Indigenous. We live between two worlds that both call and pull to us. Our culture calls us, but the society we live in pulls us closer to colonization and acculturation. Um, can I get uh, two slides over, please? Sorry. <laughs> Uh, you may be asking now, how does it affect everyone? Because make no mistake, colonialism affects everyone in education. We learn and teach in an environment that enforces stereotypical Western ideologies. Your teacher is a supreme being in your classroom. There is no teaching the teacher. You're exclusively a learner. The, this is the easiest example to see, but also the hardest to deconstruct. One that I have seen the beginning of its deconstruction at the very end of my uh, elementary and secondary education. But let us think about other examples as well. Consider our sciences. How do we de decolonize something that we see as the ba most basic and fundamental fabrics of our society? My colleague introduced me to the idea that all, not all science must be done in a controlled environment. His example was going out into the land and find, finding out why the pH levels of the soil are the way they are. Admittedly, I don't know that much about science. But I do know that access to water, rainfall, and vegetation affects the soil. Discovering why soil has differing pH levels in different environments may seem basic, but also intertwining that with Indigenous knowledge. How did my ancestors know where to settle where they did, to migrate where they did, and carry the foods and medicines that they do? I do not know how many people will learn that sort of thing in a controlled environment. Take the examples I have given you thus far today and ask. What is the future of education? Our schools are, by and large, designed for neurotypical and financially stable learners. Although this is changing, we must ask ourselves if it is changing fast enough. We know that online education is possible. A teacher can deliver lessons from their home and a learner can gain knowledge from their community. We must ask ourselves now how we can get out of the growing pains of online education and make it just as, if not more efficient than the system we currently uphold. We know ways that for about 60 or 80 years now, our education system has been operating is not the way it should operate for 80 more. The modern world needs a modern education system. We are reaching a point in our movement, in our world, and in this pandemic where we must ask ourselves if we want to prop up the system as it stands again, or if we want to change it for our children and theirs. I say that the future of education does not lie in its past, but, a future in, of, but the, in a future of education that we create together a cross-cultural and understanding future that we might not yet be able to visualize or that we might not yet be able to understand just yet. So before we continue, I actually wanna take a quick pause and take a drink and catch my breath. Uh, if there are any questions in the chat, uh, Laura will take them and I will answer the best of my ability. I don't see any questions in the chat just yet, but please do take your water break and I will be here to catch any questions that come in. Actually, have uh, two containers, one of coffee and one of water, both uh, essential to anyone working these days. Equally important. Absolutely. Okay. <clears throat> Our understanding of a decolonized classroom and education system, whatever that may mean, must come from a reliable source. Today, I stand on the territory of the Anishinaabe peoples of the Robinson-Huron Treaty. My family comes from both an unceded territory and Treaty 3 territory. I tell you this because there is an entire community that can be the source of your decolonization process. While I understand that there are many people from different territories, homelands, and motherlands here today, I want you to reflect on the territory that you stand and work from today. Do you know their names? The reserves on that territory? Do you know their community leaders? If so, I give credit to you. But if you do not, I genuinely do not blame you. It's not something that's taught frequently enough and is information that needs to be sought out. I want to start today from the top and work our way to the bottom. I want to address the people here today who have the ability to make wide arrays of change in their schools, their boards, and maybe even the system. I wanna start with the term I talked about earlier, enculturation and acculturation. The enculturated indigenous, those that have connections and knowledge to things such as ceremony, land, excuse me, culture, society, elders, community, etc., are few and far between. Uh, Dr. Andrew Judge estimated that there's less than 5% uh, 
of all indigenous people have reached that level of enculturation. The vast majority of indigenous people, myself included, are not enculturated, but that does not mean that they do not exist. Hiring practices can be a major point of contention for Indigenous peoples, not necessarily the who you are hiring, but why. As I mentioned earlier, I entered a position I was not yet prepared for, and although I think I succeeded in many aspects, uh, sorry, excuse me, although I think I succeeded, there were many aspects where I did not think what either side of that agreement was looking for. This can be the case when it comes to hiring practices anywhere. It is imperative that more and more Indigenous people, and in particular our youth, find their way to enculturation that, uh, as they find their way to enculturation, sorry, that you hire with the right mindset. Do not fill that spiritual advisor position too quickly, as it may end up backfiring. An important, an important point in conjunction with this was brought to me from a non-Indigenous perspective. There is a significant dis difference between diversity and diaspora. Diversity can be viewed as a blanket statement non-white faces essentially. Diaspora can be seen as an understanding and recognizing the homeland and cultural origin of those people that are currently within our education systems. I'm not just talking about students, but staff, faculty, and administrators as well. That is to say, understand and recognize people who come from all over the world as unique individuals with backgrounds and cultural history that goes beyond from Asia or from Africa or among a bevy of other froms that you can add in there. I also want to shift our conversation to some more tangible ideas for the people I'm addressing. There are many ways to make both high and low level changes for your schools and boards with the resources of the people of the land you inhabit. Take the exercise from earlier. If you do not know whose land you are on, ask and find out. Then gain their trust and work with them. If you cannot find in cultural in individuals that fit the bill, so to speak, then people who hold that knowledge can help you. One of the terms that we often hear these days is nation to nation relationships. I want you to take that to heart in today's discussions. Where are the educators of your nearby nations? Are they Western trained or are they traditionally trained? Do they want to help you? If it is an issue of funding, there are people there to help you find the funding for your indigenous programming, to help you find the funding to support these communities, their leaders, their teachers, so they can support you on your path to knowledge. We know it's out there and we know it's for your taking. Truth be told, this is not just about assisting Indigenous and other colonized youth in your education systems, but rather it is about ensuring that all learners in the system come up with the tools of decolonization. From our end, it becomes our responsibility to pursue our knowledge, ways, and understanding. It is your responsibility to ensure that the education system accommodates for us as well. Here in this dynamic, you can find your Indigenous art teachers, you can find your Indigenous land stewards, you can find your Indigenous teachers and leaders. By helping to build that nation-to-nation -nation relationship, the system that can sometimes break down and beat down colonized learners can uplift them, strengthen them, and give them the tools to survive in a modern and changing world. It must also be understood that there is a role in the grandfather teachings for everyone. To refresh, the seven teachings are wisdom, love, respect, bravery, honesty, humility, and truth. I want to, today I want to highlight wisdom, respect, humility, and truth. I feel as though all of these are pertinent to the classroom and school, but these four address, directly address our learning institutions. I want to highlight wisdom because it is your role as a leader with experience that may, others may not have to lead them in the right direction. Not necessarily with standardized tests or in lecture style learning, but because you are the ones who will imprint so much on these learners, no matter their age. I want to highlight respect because, it's, because respect in different cultures can mean many different things. Respect is not just sitting silent as a teacher sits in front of the class or heads down as an administrator walks through the walls. It is addressing your students in a way that lets them know that you respect them. Respect is, of course, usually a two-way street. Reevaluate how you speak to your students and even your staff. I want, to re I want you to reevaluate not because I think you disrespect your students and staff, but because you may not be giving them respect in the right ways. Have you given them the respect as a growing individual, especially in a time like this, of COVID and of potentially strange political situations? Have you given your staff respect in terms of how they maneuvered this pandemic and how are they are changing what they do nearly every day because a new challenge always appears? I want to highlight truth because truth is such a funny word these days. 
I put great weight into how we construct and use the English language, as taught to me my, by my professor, Dr. Michael DeSanto. And truth is a word that is thrown around with reckless abandon. Truth is highlighting in your classrooms real Indigenous knowledge. It is not just about our suffering in the residential schools, through the past system and other oppressions. There is, of course, still, still needs to be time and space dedicated to this history. It can never be one-off parts of education, but this should be the baseline of colonial understandings of Indigenous people. And while it is a true event, it is not the truth of our Indigenous knowledge. The decolonization and rebuilding of Indigenous knowledge happens in a time before colonization. Our ancestral teachings and our ancestral homelands with our ancestral language. I want to lastly highlight humility, the thing that can be so hard to come by in our day and age. I won't lie in saying that my peers and even my own wife must often remind me the lessons of humility, so I want to pass one on to you that I have thought a lot about. From what I understand of Anishinaabe culture, of Ojibwe culture, is that learning is an eternal, lifelong process. And although our elders have learned much throughout their long experience and fruitful lives, there is something that they can learn from a child. It may seem like an obvious statement, but I want you to apply that to your classrooms and to your students especially when you decolonize your education and introduce more Indigenous content. Be prepared for your Indigenous or other colonized youth to know more about a excuse me, topic than you do and to attempt to educate you on the topic. I want you to know that it's not a sign of disrespect either if they attempt this. I would argue it's a sign of high respect. Your students want you to get it right, to set you on that right path to knowledge, education, and truth. A student that did not respect you would not correct you instead of allowing you to live with a falsehood. I highlight these teachings for you, but this is just the beginning of our journey to improve and create a future of education together. Not just as indigenous people and settlers, not just as students and teachers, but as individuals de dedicated to a greater mission than we may be, ever be able to truly understand in our lives. I wanna now briefly share a story and one that I think is kind of funny. I, as I mentioned, I sit here uh, at Ogomi University. Ogomi University is a former, uh, the, the site that it sits on is a former residential school, the Shingwak Residential School and the Wamanash uh, Residential School. And it overlooks the, the St. Mary's River which feeds the smaller Great Lakes into the uh, larger Lake Superior. And uh, it's funny how sometimes things work. I remember not too long ago, I was listening to this song um, by Vera Keys titled, uh, We'll Meet Again. And one line in it says, we'll meet again some sunny day. On my path, truly probably what started it more than anything else to end culturation is that I lost someone very close to me. And it made me realize going back home and seeing everything that was being done that I needed to do more for myself. I'm sure that this is an experience that several others share today. I'll never forget a year later after I had lost that person that was very close to me. I went to a, a rapids to pray, deliver some tobacco, smudge and reflect upon the past year as this was in the middle of the pandemic now. It was a cloudy day, it had rained earlier. And as I'm getting ready to leave, I'll never forget the one little ray of sunshine that shone on me as I was walking away. And I bring up this story now because just before I started this presentation, another, it's cloudy right now, as I mentioned, it was snowing. Another ray of sunshine shone on me. And I was, and I was, and as I was, and as I was debating whether or not I should tell this story, a second ray of sunshine shone on me. So I knew that it was important to share the story and I share it not because 
I don't think it's irrelevant because uh, sometimes I do when I share stories. I, I feel like I go off on tangents. But in terms of education, our indigenous students, our, our colonized youth, they'll start to see those sorts of things that come to them in very small ways. I guess there's a reason why I decided to smudge the space, even though that I knew I would have to do it very briefly. Why I still had to walk through the snow to get here instead of just asking for a ride. I look on the beauty of nature and this is where I wanna take our conversation next, but before I continue, I will take, take another pause, again, for breath and for water, and if uh, there are any other questions in the chat. Thank you so much, Coulter. While you have your coffee and your water, uh, we do have someone who asked, uh, what did you burn at the beginning of the session during your smudge? So, because I'm at Algoma University, we have a, uh, um, it's not necessarily strict, but it is a little disrespectful if you burn tobacco in your uh, in your in your smudge. I burned white sage. Um, it was uh, gifted to me uh, upon my graduation. I I always burn white sage in a small little um, pot, a cast iron pan that was given to me. I think it's a cast iron egg pan, but uh, I love using it for my smudge. And I use it because it was gifted to me by one of the last people that was ever with the person I lost. They gifted to they gifted it to me um, just before Christmas of 2020. And ever since then, I've been using it exclusively. I used to use shells, but I, I shifted to this pot largely because uh, I saw a bunch of other people do it too. Um, usually when I'm at home, I'll also burn a little bit of uh, sweet grass and some cedar in it, but uh, not tobacco. Um, my wife has asthma and I don't want to set off her asthma too, too, too much. She already has troubles with smudge in the first place, but she understands how, how important it is to me. She, she too is, um, Jaganash. She's, she is English, um, white, but Truthfully, I wouldn't, I wouldn't want to spend the rest of my days with anyone else. <laughs> Beautiful. Thank you so much for sharing that with us. And, and thank you for who, who put the question in the chat. Um, I will just take one quick look. And I think that's all we have if you want to continue. Perfect. <clears throat> I've mentioned it before and I want to reiterate that the first step to learn who, uh, the first step is to learn whose land you reside on. Again, I live on the traditional territory of the Anishinaabe, and in particular, the Garden River and Batuana First Nations. This is what I consider the first step. And if you already know this, that's great. I applaud you. Now ask yourselves what language they speak. Oh, my lights just went off. Hold on, I gotta, I gotta. Oh, uh, it looks fine, Never mind. Oh, then, then they turn back on. Now ask yourselves what language they speak its cousins and relations to other languages and cultures, and if this is their traditional homeland or if they were displaced during colonization. So now that you've completed this exercise in a hypothetical situation, now that you know what you stand, it's time to know a little bit more about the history and culture. The easiest way to do this is to learn some of the colonial history and culture. It may not be the most effective or even efficient way of doing this, but having a baseline of knowledge is always important. Resources are usually available online, and from what I have seen, are easy to read. This, truthfully, can be done in a spare evening. And this will be important if you want to help build that nation-to-nation -nation relationship. And although some of what you may learn will become outdated when you learn more from the Indigenous people that you engage with, be it students, other teachers, leaders, community members, elders, etc., I at one point also got all of my knowledge from online resources. And while it is, some of it still faithfully serves me, others have been replaced by what I have learned throughout the years. It's all part of the process. I also want you to invite indigenous leaders and elders into your classroom for a lesson or two, or better yet, make it a series. If you want to be dedicated to the decolonization of education, it also can't be a one-off part of education. 
we have to start integrating Indigenous forms of knowledge and understanding and education for our future. We need mindsets and eyes that do not come from a Eurocentric idea of education in order to change education. Decolonization is going to look very different at all levels of our system. The people in your area are also going to have different ideas for how to change the system to benefit both settlers and Indigenous peoples. But it will be a path forward that we can all walk on. It will be a way of knowing and understanding that we can all learn and grow from. And I, as I was talking about in my story, while this may not be some obvious to some and completely obvious to others, I also want you to appreciate the land and territory that you are on. Find a space where you can look at the beauty of preserved nature of that territory. If you can, find out who the land stewards are, and if they allow you, observe them doing their duty. Find and grow an appreciation of the land that your Indigenous students may have. I want to share briefly, unfortunately the time has passed, but uh, it was not too long ago, uh, where I reside, there's mountains surround, all surrounding all over around Sault Ste. Marie. And at the middle to the end of October, you can see all of the colors on the trees that line the mountains and the hills. And it's just this explosion of red, orange, yellow, purple, green, and it's truly a beautiful sight to behold. And sometimes in our busy lives, as educators, as students, as administrators, we may not see and understand that nature and how important it can be to us. I've been living here in Sault Ste. Marie all of my life. And every year during those two weeks, I'm still astounded at how beautiful the land can be. I want to continue and, and I want you to find out if the First Nation around you has an official land acknowledgement for you to use. If you do believe in and like to use land acknowledgements, it can be the first step for some Indigenous youth to recognize who they are. And for other youth, and for other youth, it can be the catalyst for a wide range of knowledge available to them. If they do not, see if your city or region has one that they commonly use. I do not tell you this that you can open every class without land acknowledgement, but it might be a useful addition to presentations, speeches, and introductions. I also want to talk to you what it means about being a learner for a moment. I'm going to be a learner for all of my life, but I was an official paid learner for not too long ago. And being a learner is incredibly difficult at times. For youth, it means discovering who you are and finding out what you want to do for the rest of your life. And for older learners, it means taking a step back into a place of vulnerability. Both of these aspects and many more parts of being a learner make it the duty of the education system not to be uh, to be better, excuse me, for the learners of the future. Take for the example the innocently, seemingly innocent notation of not seeing color. It may put everyone on an equal playing field in theory, but in practice it perpetuates oppression and violence in our education systems, as sometimes it removes our identity and hides the individual. Our systems have to look at every person inside of it as an incredibly unique individual, coming from cultures and histories that might have to be taken into account, whether that be culture, race, sexuality, gender, and more. As one of the reasons why I fell in love with education. I found myself in a system that didn't see my identity as a problem, nor did it see my identity as a political entity. Instead, it saw a person with a unique background and culture that had many different facets and had come from many different paths that led me to where I am today. I had only truly received that in my final years of my education. And I want you to imagine what would happen if someone had that from the very beginning. I also want to address the classroom for a moment. Earlier, I discussed that sometimes our education system is not designed for people that are going through it, whether that be uh, developmental, mental health, or physical disabilities, our education system is slowly catching up in order to accommodate for these people. I am sure that we all understand that when it comes to access to education, there is still a long way to go. There are many different examples that we can bring into us. And I'm sure we all have examples of someone who was failed by the education system because of something that was totally out of their control. I asked my colleague where she wanted to see the education system in 25 years. Her number one concern was that access to education in terms of people navigating it and the costs associated with it. To her, in a way, part of that change in access and part of access to education is also using it as a tool of self-discovery. We can bring our self-discovery to learning. And that can mean a million different things to different individuals. 
all of whom will one day change the world. Another one of my colleagues wanted to see changes in our education system that are driven to benefit our society and our students. The way he put it was, if it can be understood from an indigenous lens, then it can be understood from a decolonized lens. There are millions of other things that we can address on the classroom level. Using more hands-on or discussion-based learning styles, incorporating more indigenous ways of knowing and understanding from the people of the territory that you reside on, finding non-Eurocentric ways of creating lessons or including it in your pedagogy, finding the truth that has been hidden from us for so, so long, the classroom is really just the beginning of our future. And it's something that we're all aware of, even if we don't want to give ourselves a pat on the back. I want to talk more about a million different things to you all, but I have to leave time for two things. And that's the reason why I'm brought here today in questions at the end. <laughs> I guess for lack of a better one, this kind of serves as a conclusion, but I promise you it's a very long one. I want to talk to you about today about what brought me here on this journey I, I am on today, and I hope it has a similar effect on people here. I want to talk about Chief Shingwok's vision. And I know that across Ontario and probably beyond, unfortunately, I'm not that knowledgeable, there are similar visions. This was a vision 200 years ago about a cross-cultural teaching wigwam, where Indigenous children can learn the tools of the trades and of the modern world while maintaining their traditional teachings and culture. Chief Shingwak was so passionate about his vision, he snowshoed from this area, what we now call Sault Ste. Marie Algoma, to York to advocate for this vision. Unfortunately, despite, how do I want to say this? A fervent desire to fulfill this vision. Unfortunately, this vision was corrupted by their ancestors into what we now know as the residential schools. However, several institutions and people have dedicated themselves to the restoration of this vision. When I was in school, this was the first time I heard of Chief Shingwok's vision, likely in 2019, 2018. And I immediately fell in love, largely because the vision has expanded and it is the perfect time for it. We live in a time of change. And it's not just because of our pandemic that we're currently going through, but because we are looking to the future and how we want to shape it. Earlier, I asked if this is the way our education system operates today and if we, and if it, and how it has operated yesterday, if it is the way that it will operate tomorrow. We have to take the option for change. We have to take the option for a future that's created together, hand in hand, and a cross-cultural teaching wigwam. To take the words of a fellow student that I looked up to, I want to graduate with my diploma in one hand and a feather in another. And that's the future I see for Indigenous students. But my vision itself is limited, and I will humble myself by saying that. I don't need, know, necessarily know the needs of other people outside of that limited vision. While in the future it may expand, I have work to do here. And that's where I bring all of you today, here into Chief Shingwak's vision. If not for the vision itself, at least for the inspiration, what does a cross-cultural future look like in Canada? What do the three realities of Canadians look like in Ontario? For English Canadians, for French Canadians, and for Indigenous peoples. I want you to think about the, future, the vision of the future of education. What part do you play in it? What part do I play in it? What part do your students play in it? What part does your communities, your schools, your boards, post-secondary institutions, what do they have to play in it? Who is included in this, vision, in this vision of the future of education? And unfortunately, as I mentioned, we can all have limited vision. Who is excluded? I want you to think especially about that one because sometimes we can unintentionally exclude the people that we want to, that we want to help. I also want you to think about your definition of Eurocentrism and decolonization. These are two terms that I have thrown around throughout my presentation, but I never necessarily defined. And it's very hard to define what both of these terms mean. I recall when I was uh, at a conference once, we were updating our policy structures and someone had suggested that we act in a decolonized way. And me, the other indigenous person in the room and another colonized, and a fellow colonized youth, we all got together and said, well, what does that actually mean from a policy structure standpoint? We actually, 
talked to people and helped vote it down because it seemed it didn't seem genuine. It seemed like they just wanted those words inside of that policy to make themselves maybe look better or potentially even feel better. Even today, as I'm sitting on the site of a former residential school, which now houses uh, Anishinaabe education and language classes in the former dormitories, I still have a hard time defining decolonization. Eurocentrism is a little bit easier to define for me. Eurocentrism, the way that I have defined it, is that you don't really know what Eurocentrism is until you go outside of that norm. That's when you start turning heads. That's when people start raising their eyebrows. When you go outside of that norm, which in Canada can largely be traced back to Great Britain, France, and potentially some other places, once you go outside of that long established norm for about 200 years, 300 years, 400 years, that's where you find Eurocentrism. And when I want to define decolonization, I don't necessarily just look to indigenous people. I look to all colonized youth. I look to all colonized people. When I think of decolonization, I think of those in South Africa. I think of those on New Zealand, those in Hawaii, those in Australia, the Sami people of Finland and more. And when I think of all of those people, I have to think, what does decolonization mean to them? Because decolonization here, and Bawa Ting might have a different definition than it does in South Africa. It might have a different definition than it does for the Maori in New Zealand. <sighs> and I wrote down here, <laughs> I, I've been going off script a little bit. Uh, it may not be something I can define until I'm a little more experienced and have a few more years under my belt. I leave all of those questions with you, and I want to open the floor for your questions. We're uh, we're eight minutes under time, and I feel like that's a pretty good, uh, pretty good place to stop. I thank you so. Oh, I get my video working. Thank you so much, Coulter, and be, on behalf of all the attendees, on behalf of eCampus Ontario, thank you for sharing your really personal story today. You are, as always, an exceptional storyteller, and I I just thank you so much for all the personal that you brought to it because it really does mean a lot to all of us to open yourself up like this today and we, we have a few questions in the chat uh, but just as you mentioned since we're ahead of time before I get to them I wanted to ask if you wanted to talk a little bit about that one slide that I accidentally skipped over um, let me flip to it if there's anything you wanted to say about the photographs um, on this slide so uh, I actually love these pictures so the first picture on the left that's a teaching lodge, a traditional Anishinaabe teaching lodge that students, staff, and community members of Bawating helped build behind Shingwa Kinema Gagamix uh, Anishinaabe Discovery Center. All of the saplings and all of the main support structures were all chopped down by hand by students, staff, and community members and brought back to the site where it now currently stands and tied together uh, over the course of two days. The whole ceremony was three days long and people were working from 8 a.m. to 8 p.m. on the first day and 8 a.m. to about two on the second day when everything was finished. Um, on the right is an image used by Algoma University quite commonly um, because what we like to do here and what I wanted to use an example is that sometimes discovering who you are and learning who you are is not just done through building teach a teaching lodge. I know quite a few people that got interested in their culture because they found beading and metallurgy such as copper to be an interesting part of the culture and learning the history behind both of those. I think that both of those, I think both of these perfectly, really perfectly encapsulate what it means to be, uh, or what it means to be a decolonizing Indigenous youth. I'll never forget the power and the feeling of tying together that lodge uh, and holding those branches together for people. 
as they tied it together. It was it was difficult. It's hard, and it's it strains you. And um, I actually have uh, early onset symptoms of carpal tunnel, but I ignored those burning sensations because I knew that this was more important than temporary feelings in my in my forearms. And the next picture is, oh, we're on the next slide, sorry. So this is just some indigenous uh, learners that came into the uh, Anishinaabe Discovery Center and just wanted to study. But I thought I wanted to take pictures of them um, because we very rarely have students inside of our center. And I just wanted to socialize with them. Uh, they were all They were all old colleagues and peers of mine when I was going to school. Um, but I thought that in this space that we have built for Indigenous students to finally have students in it felt powerful, it felt good. And I wanted to capture that moment. Uh, unfortunately, the picture has been cut off, but I couldn't really couldn't find a better one of each of them because they each told a story going around in a, in a circle. And they all, they all look so encapsulated with each other. And they're truly listening to each other as they tell these stories. And this is what I wanted to bring up, the third reality of Canada. Our culture and land calls us to decolonize, to remember our roots, and to enculturate. But the society that we live in, whatever, however you want to define that, pulls us closer to colonization because that's the Eurocentric norm. That's where you want to see people in those, in those stereotypical nine to five jobs, going on that march every day to uh, just make someone money for lack of a better term, really. Um, so finding that, just seeing that passion in these people, in these learners, just listening to each other tell stories, really reminded me of what I'm here for and why I'm here because I did all of my education in the past year and a half online. And sometimes you can kind of forget what that passion looks like when it's not behind a screen and when it's in person. And this was just sharing stories. It wasn't talking about projects or assignments or anything like that. They were just telling each other stories of, what, of how their lives have been going really. That, that community building that happens outside the classroom, outside of those regular topics are so important. And I think this slide is, is such an important one for all attendees to keep in mind as, as we go forward and try and answer that question you posed to us at the end, what does that cross-cultural education system look like in Ontario and in Canada, that nation to nation? Um, and, and knowing what our Indigenous students and our Indigenous communities are facing um, is so, so important. But if it's okay with you, I will uh, go to the chat with some questions. So I will read them out to you and uh, we'll just start with the first one from Laura. Um, the question goes like this. I keep hearing on the one hand to invite people into our classes and at the same time that we cannot place the burden on Indigenous people. How do you recommend balancing the need to have Indigenous speakers in our classes and the need to make the conversation one that everyone engages in? I am a white woman who teaches a class where we address Indigenous issues. That's a very tough question, and I'm glad that you asked that, because it, it, it is true. Um, I think that is truly up to the person that you ask. And it may seem disrespectful, but you also have to ask in the right ways. Uh, where I'm from, if you wanted to ask an elder to come into a classroom, you bring them tobacco, and that's how they know uh, that they know that you're serious. If you wanted to come in, them to come in and, and share their knowledge, you have to come to them with tobacco and then ask them of, 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 of the task that you want to give them. And this is where I recommend searching out what the protocols and the teachings of are on your territory, on the one that you reside on. Because when you bring that element of seriousness and really for lack of a better term, knowing what you're doing, then they will come in. It's very likely that they will come in unless of course there's a scheduling conflict or anything like that. And I find that that's really the best way is that you have to meet them in the middle. You can't, you can't really just walk up to them and say, hey, do you wanna come into my class for 
three hours uh, on Tuesday and talk about these incredibly traumatic events that may have happened to your people. It has to be from a nation to nation perspective and one that uh, respects your nation and one that respects ours as well. Thank you very much. That was a great question. I'm gonna have to write that one down. <laughs> I'll send it to you, I'll send it to you. And I think it also speaks to uh, Coulter to what you were saying earlier in, in your presentation that there is that desire, um, but going with that intentionality, that seriousness you spoke of, um, and, and also probably accepting no as a very formidable answer. If like you said, there's scheduling conflicts or other reasons why that engagement might not take place in that specific time. Mm -hmm. Wonderful, thank you for that question. I'll, I'll let everyone know the questions are of course still open. Uh, Coulter, our second question here goes or reads as this. Um, Coulter, on November 30th, 2021, Barbados decides to replace its head of state with a president. Do you see an indigenous leader in an integrated Canadian future? That too is difficult to answer because the ways that we see leaders differs from coast to coast. We can all have someone that we look up to, I would say that. We can all have someone that we aspire to be. I mean, sometimes I look at uh, Wab Gesheg Rice and how he publishes books and how I want to do that one day. <laughs> and, he, and in many ways, he too is a leader. Um, but do I see this sort of, a sort of pan-Indigenous leader? I don't necessarily think so, no. Um, but again, I see someone that we all look up to. I, I'll take it back to Idol No More. Um, I had her name. Unfortunately, I cannot remember it, but she was a chief and she went on a water, uh, a water diet in protest. I'll have to look up her name right now because I don't want to disrespect her. Uh, she, and in that moment, she was, uh, we all looked up to her because she, she refused to eat, to, to um, get her daily calorie needs until she met with the governor general. Uh, let me look up her name right now. Is it by chance Teresa Spence? We had someone in the, send that our way. I think, yes, yes, yes it is. I can't believe I forgot that. <laughs> That's okay. Wonderful. And I'll, so, so thank you for answering that question. I'll ask if the, if the person who submitted it has any other follow-up. I will check the Q&A once again. You have, a, you have some comments here from your colleagues at Algoma uh, congratulating you on a wonderful presentation. I wanna say thank you too, Sharazad. It's, it's, it's sometimes it's, it's hard to get up in front of people and really be that vulnerable. And I think that too is a part of decolonization because I participate in this as well sometimes, but there's this image of the indigenous person that you see. And this is what I, I wrote a lot about is how do we, where, where do we find these images and where can we deconstruct them? Because you look at all of these old black and white pictures and you see all of these old um, great warriors and these chiefs in, in, in regalia staring off into the distance on their horses, but um, the guy who took those pictures actually encouraged them and paid them to get set up in positions and po in poses like that. Um, but that's the image that we have of Indigenous people. So that very stoic, stone-faced sort of image of an Indigenous man, I have to deconstruct and be that vulnerable person for a moment. It is difficult, yes, <laughs> um, but I'm very happy to be here and uh, I'm glad that you guys are proud of me. <laughs> That's wonderful. And I, again, I, we can't stress enough how much we are grateful for that vulnerability that you brought to us today. And I hope through our questions and our conversations, we can give that back to you. Um, oh, I have a question coming in. Uh, what advice do you have for individuals who want to work in allyship with indigenous learners? I think, as I mentioned, the first steps is ensuring that you're getting it right, because it's very easy to look online and see very general information. And this is what I used to do as well. 
Um, and we, I'm sure we have all known people who have done this in, in one way or another. It's very easy to look up general information and then get it wrong. Um, my first step, my, the first step is to look into who are the people on your uh, that you're that you were talking to. What is their history and culture? Is this their traditional homeland, or or, or were they expelled? Um, what is their language? What are some of their very basic protocols? And sometimes you can get this online, and sometimes you can't. Um, eCampus Ontario, actually, I learned has quite a has quite a, a, a catalog of some of these. So um, it, it can be easy to find. And it's, it's also just very important to know if you want to be an ally, if you want to work in allyship with Indigenous people, is understanding where they're coming from, both physically and metaphysically, because they'll have an attachment to that land, what it means to them, far greater than I will ever understand. Absolutely. I read once that um, uh, allyship is a term or an ally that non-Indigenous, in the context of relationship with Indigenous peoples, is not something we should give ourselves as non-Indigenous people. And I, was, I wonder if you would agree with that. When I think, I, I always think in this cross-cultural context, and I think that in your heart of hearts and in your, in your spirit, you believe that you're an ally, then you can call yourself that. But you have to believe it and you have to do that very hard work. You have to humble yourself all the time in the presence of Indigenous people because we've all seen it. We've all pe seen people take allyship for advantage. Mm -hmm. um, and, that, and that can be difficult to, to delineate sometimes. But if you, if you want to do that hard, hard work for, the, for and be an ally, I would say that at some point you can, especially if other people start calling you ally, that's when you can own that term. Yeah. But again, if in your spirit and your heart of hearts you believe you are, I would say that you can. Wonderful. Wonderful. We have another question in the chat. Um, okay, this is from Robert Luke, and it reads, Coulter, thank you for this inspiring discussion. Your point about the modern world needing a modern education system is important. Given we are here to talk about teaching, learning, and technology, what would you say are some of the key possibilities for this future when we think about the mediated education we are practicing, we are practicing now? That's difficult to answer in some ways, because my first thought, especially for Indigenous people, is very, what may, might seem very obvious is dictionaries. But the dialect for say here is in, in, in Bawating is different than it is on Manitoulin Island. And it's different, the, it's different roughly every um, 100, 100 kilometers you go in very minor ways, but that 100 kilometers adds up quite, quite fast. Um, so building online dictionaries can be a way to start, but you have to be careful about the sort of understanding that sort of dialect uh, um, problem, I would call it, uh, and understanding that I can read something, um, but it might not necessarily be, be what people say here. Um, in my introduction, actually, I, I, I fuse some dialects. Uh, I say in the very beginning, let me try speaking in Nishina Bemwen, Ninga Gajwej to Nishina Bemwen. Um, but when I say my given name, my first given name, Nimki Norin Ojibwe Mang, that's it's the same word, but it's different because some people will say, oh, it's the Ojibwe language rather than saying it's the Anishinaabe language. But instead of picking and choosing, I fuse them together, which might could be confusing to some people. But uh, I think that that's an important step. I also think that uh, expanding, uh, truthfully, I think that expanding online education um, and especially in how it reaches indigenous learners and expanding uh, uh, um, internet networks for re reservations is a very, very key point um, because the more indigenous learners that you can get in your classroom, whether they be physical or virtual, the better. I, I truly do believe that. Um, but that can, that, that can be attributed also to just spitballing here, transportation technologies, lots of reserves or special access can only be accessed at a certain period of time. Um, how do we get them to be able to be accessed year round? 
that sort of thing. Um, and I think when it comes to other key technologies in uh, a modern decolonized classroom is ensuring that you have all of the tools given to you. This is assuming that you're building a nation to nation relationship um, by, the, by the nations that you're residing with and the, and the land that you're residing on. Um, but those tools might not also not also be uh, always be physical tools. They can be uh, modes and methods of understanding. And I think that in its own way um, can be considered a technology. Absolutely, absolutely. The, the infrastructure, the modes of engagement, all of, all of it is relevant and, and part of the technology piece, absolutely. Mm -hmm. Robert Lutz says, thank you for that answer. We have another one uh, that came in. And um, the question is, do universities like Algoma University have exclusively indigenous speaking programs? So that's going to differ from university to university. Here at Algoma University, we do have an Anishinaabe Edmund program. Um, and before COVID, we also offered um, uh, not integrated. What's the word I'm looking for? Immersion. That's the word I'm looking for. Immersion, like two week long immersion courses. Um, but because of COVID and the immersion course requiring lots of very close contact, um, we had to we had to postpone them. But it's different from region to region. Uh, some places like Matagami First Nation uh, host their own culture camps. Uh, that is that is immersion based, um, and other universities. Uh, part part of my job is looking this up. It, all have their not all, but a good portion of them do have, uh, and at the very least, Anishinaabemwin or non Anishinaabemwin language courses, uh, and some have language programs. Uh, it's really just luck of the draw, depending on where you reside. Um, but yeah, I would say that they're 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 not necessarily uncommon but uh, they can be difficult to find sometimes. And unfortunately, just based on how the, structure, uh, the, how the system is structured, difficult to fund. Um, but hopefully that's something that we can change in the future. Absolutely, wonderful. Thank you for that question. And let me check my other window. Uh, we have three minutes left. So not seeing any other questions, I will end with one of my own, if that's okay. Um, yesterday, we had, we had another keynote speaker, Dr. Valerie Irvine. And, she had a quote that as soon as she said it, it, it made me think of you and I wanted to bring it to you today. Uh, she said, learning is where the learner is. And it, and it medi immediately made me think of our, of our conversation about land-based education. And in, and in your uh, presentation, you talked about um, it being about community or not just about community outreach or construction. And I was wondering if you could share a little bit more about the importance of land-based education for yourself and, and from your experience. Wow. When it comes to land-based education, that is truly where you can get all of the hands-on experiences when it comes to culture and language. And think of it as an apprenticeship, really. If you wanna translate it to that, to that Western mode of understanding doesn't translate perfectly, but let's use it as an example. You get that hands-on experience with someone who is above you in terms of that, in, in terms of a Western structure, uh, and they impart their knowledge onto you. Similar thing happens with land-based knowledge, though we're all learners, we're all learning from each other. So when it comes to that sort of aspect where you're all learning from each other, but there are people who know more than you, um, that sort of how it goes. I guess that's the best way I can put it is, is the apprenticeship model. You're learning pr from someone who knows more than you and that hands-on in-person experience. And that's something that you don't forget. Like I'll, I'll never forget some of the teachings and some of the stories that were told when we were building that teaching lodge. Just some of the most fascinating people I've ever met. And I've only, and I only knew them for a weekend, truly. Right. Right. Beautiful. Thank you so much. Thank you. And, oh, 2.15, not, I will give 30 more seconds for any last minute questions if they want to come in. Um, Coulter, we're getting lots of thank yous and uh, wonderful remarks in the chat. Again, on behalf of 
eCampus Ontario and all our attendees today. Thank you so much for everything that you've shared with us. Um, your storytelling is, is unmatched and I'm, we're so grateful to have you here. Um, all attendees, we now have a 15 minute break before the rest of our sessions begin. Um, so enjoy the rest of your afternoon. Have a wonderful weekend after attending TESS, of course. And Coulter, thank you. And, and we'll talk to you soon. Lots of thank yous coming in the chat. I just wanted to say a big chi miigwech to everyone here. I know that sometimes I can be a monotonous storyteller. I know that sometimes I can be uh, go off on tangents. I'm very happy that you all listened to me today. And I'm very, very glad that all of you could make it and ask me questions. Uh, it's been an honor and a pleasure to be here in your presence. And I wish you all a very good day. Thank you very much. Thank you.